Hello, welcome back to Shield Maiden in the Kitchen. My name is Terry and I am the Shield Maiden. And today I am very happy and very lucky to have joining me a good friend and longtime colleague at the college where we both teach, and that is Dr. Christopher Brooks. Hey everybody. <laughs> welcome to Thanks. my kitchen. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you for coming. So Chris, like me, is a historian who likes to cook, and we were talking about this channel. And the fact that in 2019, Chris made it out before COVID and actually got to Scotland. And I am headed to Scotland later this year. And so we thought it would be interesting and fun to get together and make a recipe that has some pretty deep historic roots and is something that a lot of people think is quintessentially Scottish. And that is haggis. So now before you go, ew, and turn the channel, <laughs> Give us the benefit of the doubt, right? Absolutely. Hang with us here because Chris has assured me that he has a recipe that is not only tasty, but is easy to make. And so I'm willing to give it a try. I have never made it. And full disclosure, I have never eaten haggis either. But because I'm an adventurous cook and an adventurous eater, uh, I'm going to give Chris the benefit of the doubt and we'll give this a try, see what happens. And so I hope you stay with us and I hope you give it a try as well. Now, because we are historians, we like to mix history in, and you know that's what this channel is about if you've watched my other videos. And so we will talk about the history of this dish. And also, of course, because this is Shield Maiden in the Kitchen, we will talk a little bit about Vikings, because Vikings traveled pretty far and wide in their world, but that meant uh, they went to a place that was very close to them, of course, and that is Scotland. So with that, you ready to get started? I'm ready to get started. All right, let's cook. Here we have the ingredients for our haggis all ready to go. You can see there's several different types of spices that we have here. And then also, I guess as a binder, right? Steel cut oats. <laughs> um, and then some onion, of course. Um, and so we'll begin to do some sauteing in this um, Dutch oven, and this is also where we'll bake it as well. Is that right? Okay. And then we have our two meats here. We have ground lamb and then also chicken livers. So, um, and again, I've never done this before, so I'm not exactly sure uh, why that particular mixture of meats, but maybe Chris will be able to give us uh, a little bit of information about that. So let me set this down and we can begin to cook. Okay. So, go for it. Okay, do you want to fire that sucker up and we'll get yeah. underway with the onion? So, what's a uh, heat? Just go for a medium. So, something like that? Uh, or yeah, maybe a little bit lower, than, oh, somewhere in the middle there. Yeah, that'll do. All right, All so right. Like medium heat. Yep. All right. And like practically everything that is good to eat, you start by doing onion. So, you just uh, chuck in the butter to melt, and then we'll saute the onion. And so, while we're uh, melting the butter here. I'll just kind of mention a few things about this. A haggis is a classic British Isles pudding, which is kind of related to sausage, the basic idea you chop up a bunch of stuff and you put it in a casing. But with a pudding, it's usually steamed or boiled inside some kind of a container. So people who have heard of haggis know that the traditional version uses a sheep's stomach, which is, Americans tend to get grossed out by that, but it's actually just a really practical way to cook something, because the sheep's stomach is you know, it's, it's watertight, you can pile everything in there, and then you can just pop it into, you know, a cauldron, some kind of a pot, anything that could be used to cook the, uh, the stuff that you put in. And traditionally, a haggis would have been made with a lot of organ meats. And so again, I think the reason Americans get freaked out is the idea that you're eating sometimes as many as three different kinds of chopped up organ meats, and it's in a sheep's stomach. Um, but, and then the other thing is, you know, Terry mentioned the oats. The oats are absolutely essential because in a lot of traditional British puddings, oats are the grain that pads everything out. It, it, they absorb all the juices from the meats. And it's actually a really, really delicious part of the pudding, the haggis in this case. We're doing a simplified version that uses the Dutch oven instead of a sheep's stomach. And the only organ meat we're using is chicken liver because they're easy to get. Um, you can get it from, you know, pretty much any decent butcher is going to have chicken liver. It's really, really cheap, and it's actually super healthy and super tasty. Um, so this is a version that is, would probably scare Americans a little bit less because that is the only organ meat that we're using. Yeah, I have to say when I first read uh, the recipe when you sent it to me, um, especially because of the addition of the oats, what it sort of reminded me of is when I make meatloaf. You know, yeah, because meatloaf yeah. has kind of breadcrumb or some other sort of binder in a grind, mm -hmm. you know, ground meat 
mixture that has varying spices and stuff in it. And so only thing that you know seemed different was that it wasn't like maybe that put puddingy consistency yeah. ultimately. Um, no, but that's actually a really good comparison. I hadn't thought of that. And actually, you mentioned spices, and that's the other essential thing with a savory pudding is almost without exception, a savory pudding is going to include a lot of spice. And what's fun about haggis, like a lot of British puddings, is that it has spices that would have been easy to cultivate in the British Isles, things like thyme, for example, and it has spices that would have had to have been imported, you know, like um, allspice and coriander. Uh, so, you know, it's by the time you get into the 1700s, spices from other parts of the world have been going to the British Isles for hundreds of years, you know, at least since the Crusades, and they were really integrated into a lot of quintessentially English or Scottish or both dishes, to like haggis. Yeah, I read part of the history of this too as far as with um, what you were saying about the sheep stomach and um, that if people, you know, through hunting or whatever, but also I suppose butchering animals if you did it in the field, I don't, I don't think they did that a ton, but anyway, um, if it was, you know, say a, a wild game type of meat or something that, you know, you, you cut that apart, you know, you dress it maybe in the field and then the, the, the stomach just sort of also became kind of a convenient, easy sort of mm. carrying pack, right. pouch for, um, you know, helping to get the meat out. So, um, but this is a really old recipe, right? And so, do you, yeah, what do you know a little bit about whether or not it's very Scottish? Actually? Yeah, so that's the fun thing. You know, everybody thinks of haggis as being like the essential Scottish dish. It's one of the national dishes of Scotland and rightly so. I mean, when I was in Scotland in 2019, I had haggis probably six or seven times. Um, you know, various variations on the recipe, and it, every one of them was delicious. And the thing is that, as far as anyone can tell from old cookbooks and references and literature and so on, a haggis was some kind of pudding, and usually the ingredients weren't specified. Um, in the early cookery books, there were different versions floating around. From around the, the Renaissance era, you know, they start showing up in the 1400s, 1500s, thereabouts. And those recipes and references are from both England and Scotland. So haggis eventually becomes associated with Scotland rather than England, in part because the English start looking down their noses at things that Scottish peasants are eating. This is like 18th century. Yeah, right? exactly. So early yeah. 1700s are the pivotal century for that because, you know, England, um, after the Highland clearances, when um, Scottish people were kicked off their land and big landlords took over uh, the land to create commercial sheep farms, and there was you know famine and starvation, and it was really an awful century for a lot of people in Scotland. Yeah. And one of the reactions is Scottish people were forced to eat cheaper foods, like organ meats and like oats. And since haggis was already made from those things, more people were eating haggis and things like haggis in Scotland, while the English were moving in different directions with their, their cooking. And so it was really the English holding haggis in contempt as the Scottish thing that helped Scots defiantly adopt haggis as that, you know, something that was really theirs. And by the end of the 1700s, you know, early Scottish nationalists are getting very proud about haggis as a Scottish thing. And that carries over into the 19th century, you know, the great century when nationalism is flourishing all over Europe and haggis really has become a, a Scottish symbol of pride by the early 1800s. Mostly to stick it to the English. Yeah, originally, yeah. <laughs> well, and the whole thing of, you know, the um, the Highlanders being regarded as these, you know, savages by the English yeah. to being Hicks like these... The yeah, exactly. <laughs> to being actually these proud warriors, you know, that, right. the, that the English were happy... Awesome. Yeah, that the English were happy to enlist in their army so they right. could go out and right. colonize the rest of the world, right. you know? Right, Yeah, it's funny how, you know, with... Um, historians have done so much work on the invention of tradition Right, that all these nationalist symbols, yes, they genuinely usually have roots in the national history of a given place, right. but they're also things that have their own history and they started becoming symbols at a certain time to serve a political end, and it's usually caught up in a nationalist movement. Yeah, yeah, exactly. All right, I think we're pretty good with the, the onion there. It's just kind of, it's not browned, we're not trying to brown it, we're just softening it and kind of sweating it a little bit. Okay, so let's see, I'll um, get this in so we can kind of take a look. Okay. So, just got a softening of the onion there, and then you're going to begin to add spices. some spices. Yeah, okay. so we're just going to, we're going to chuck in all the spices. So we've got pepper and then going down, okay. so got some cinnamon. It's the thyme, right? Side. Yes, and thyme. I will have the recipe posted in the description as usual, so 
Don't worry. And we should mention this is from a cooking blog that I found at carolinescooking.com. Yep. And so thanks, we're, uh, thanks to her for the recipe. <laughs> we're historians who always give credit. We cite our sources. We do. We do. All right. So mixing the spices in. So we had a mixture there of some cinnamon, thyme, allspice, ground coriander, and black pepper. And nutmeg as well. And nutmeg. Yeah. So really it's kind of interesting with these types of dishes that you see a lot actually in medieval cookery and I've mentioned this before in one of my other videos where there's a very interesting kind of sweet and savory mix oftentimes. All right, we're going in with the chicken livers now. I like to let the spices just kind of bloom in the heat for a minute and get kind of once you get a nice aroma coming off then you can start with the meats. Okay, so and this is half a pound of yeah. chicken liver. And what we're going to do is brown both the liver, actually I could probably turn that up a notch. Yeah. Just gonna brown that up a little and then we'll throw in the lamb and we'll do the same thing. So one of the interesting things too in reading about haggis for this, um, you know, I'm always kind of interested in the linguistics and uh, you know, sort of the etymology of the word and everything. And especially because, you know, as some of the viewers know, I spend a fair amount of time in Iceland in the summers and going to the grocery store to buy things like ground beef in Iceland and it's called hack, spelled H-A-K-K. So the Norse word for basically ground or minced meat is hack, and it sounds very similar to me. Right, to well and then there's haggis. the French connection, you know, haché is the, the French verb to chop. That's where we get the, the English word hatchet. And so there's, you know, one of the theories is maybe the maybe even as early as the Norman influence, you know, the, the creation of pudding in the first place involved chopping stuff up, you yeah, know? Yeah. So it also, you know, it does kind of bring to mind the fact that this recipe has a much deeper, broader history than, you know, just being this Scottish thing. Although to be clear today, Scotland is the place to go for haggis. They do serve it in England. I've had it in England. It's perfectly good. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, if you go to pretty much any decent Scottish cafe or restaurant, they're going to have an awesome haggis. Actually, I'm going to rinse my hand off. Okay. And so we just uh, let this cook together for a little bit, and uh, then we will move on to the next step of getting it ready to put into the oven. All right, we got browned meat going now, so we're going to add some stock. You can do this with beef stock or veggie stock, or um, honestly, I just do store-bought chicken broth a lot of the time. I can't really tell the difference with the finished product. So today we're using beef stock, and it was one cup. Yep, one cup. And we're just going to bring that up to a nice simmer, and then turn the heat down and let it hang out on the stovetop for 20 minutes. Okay, and then while we're doing that, I will give you a bit of your Viking lesson. So we, those of you who've watched my videos before know that the Vikings largely existed in a world that was, you know, pre-literate, at least in the modern sense. And that was for much of their uh, time, as far as talking about the Viking Age proper. And that was until Christianity comes in. But before that, you know, we've got a lot of traditions that, of course, are not written down anywhere. So what we're stuck with is kind of hypothesizing about the things that they ate based on how they farmed, where they lived, you know, what they had available to them and everything. I mean, and this is a, a meat dish. Uh, this to me is quintessentially something that could have been easily a Viking dish uh, because of the way it's prepared, uh, the way it's uh, made to be something that can uh, last uh, for a little bit of time and uh, it can be made with various different types of meats and so um, of course they would have had domesticated animals that they could have used for this like i.e. ground beef or lamb uh, as in the case that we're using today or they could have done it with wild game uh, as well. And uh, as to the Scotland connection, I mean since of course you know we have been talking about haggis as a Scottish dish, uh, the Vikings most definitely were in Scotland. Uh, if you look at a map, uh, particularly the Norwegians, you see it's very, very close uh, from a sailing standpoint, which of course is mostly what the Vikings did by way of travel. You're only talking about maybe a four to five day journey uh, if you just head straight west to get to some of the islands just off the northern uh, tip of Scotland. And so the Orkney, uh, the Shetland, uh, even the Faroe, even though typically that's, or not typically, but technically I should say, that's not Scottish, it's Danish territory uh, today. But 
uh, but also even the northern parts of the Scottish mainland proper, those were all settled by Vikings uh, in the late 9th century. So about the same time, for those of you who know, uh, that the Vikings also sailed across the North Atlantic and began to settle in Iceland as well. So say the 870s and onward. And so there is very much uh, a deep genetic presence in Scotland. And I first noticed it actually in traveling to Norway. Mm. Uh, and again, I've never been to Scotland and I'll, I'll hopefully be able to get there later this year. But uh, in traveling to Norway, it was unbelievable to both me and Tom, my husband, uh, how many Scottish tourists there mm. were. It was like they were going to the home. There, there's a real something. sense of, of connection and pride in Scotland. They have yeah. Viking festivals yeah. in, in northern Scotland, especially in the islands, like you mentioned, that, that every year, and it's, it's the big thing. Yeah, 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 and there's definitely, you know, we've uncovered Viking settlements, for sure, and we also know through modern DNA uh, and isotopic analysis, and I am going to credit my, my good friend, uh, Dr. David Zori at Baylor University for this information, um, that, you know, there are many Sort of genetic admixtures that point uh, in no large amount to, or sorry, I should say no small amount to Scandinavian ancestry uh, in those areas of Scotland, again, primarily like the Orkneys and the Shetlands uh, and the northern part of Scotland. When you get to the more central and southern parts of Scotland, then you start to see more of a mixture uh, with the English. Uh, but as far as those northern tips go, uh, we're definitely talking about Viking territory. So, haggis could be uh, a scene as a potentially Viking meal as well. All right, so we're gonna let that cook for probably another 15 minutes or so, and then we'll get it ready to put in the oven. All right, the next phase of the recipe now that the meat has had a chance to cook with the broth for 20 minutes, we are going to stir in the oats and get it ready to put into the oven. So these are steel cut oats actually, so not your regular flat rolled oats. Still very easy to find though in normal grocery stores, which is nice. Yep, exactly. Don't they eat that more in Scotland than like the flat rolled uh, kind? I believe Steel so. Kind? I think it's kind of a Scottish-Irish thing, if I remember. Yeah. All right, so we'll turn off the stove top, pop the lid back on. So it's cooked covered. And then it just hangs out in the oven, thinking about how it's been naughty for the next, what is it, about a half hour. Let's see, make sure I'm right about that when I'm saying that. Yes. Okay, so we've got um, a 350 oven, right? Yeah. And I've just had it on regular bake, not convection. And so for those of you abroad, that would be one about 180. Um, all right, so now we will just hang out and wait for the next step. 30 minutes are up, and we are now going to take our haggis out of the oven and take a look at what we've got. That is what it is supposed to look like. So then it goes back in for 10. Okay. And while we do this, this is the completely not purest part. This will probably shock and horrify haggis purist, but honestly, this recipe is already the simplified version. This is, we're gonna melt some brie, which I had when I was in Scotland in uh, the small city of Elgin. Um, and I had lunch at uh, Johnston's of Elgin, which is a really, really high-end, beautiful uh, woolen mill place. And they had this incredible cafe and haggis was served with sourdough bread and melted brie. And when I got back to the States and I started making my own haggis, I was like, oh, I'm definitely doing that. So I highly recommend this combination, even though it is in no way, shape, or form traditional. Okay, so then our haggis and our brie are in there for another 10 minutes, right? Yes, you said. And, and then we're done. And then we're done. And then I have prepared some sourdough bread. And so that's waiting for us. And we will put this all together and see what everything tastes like. Here is our finished haggis, and we have already dished out some to get ready to have our lunch. But I wanted to show you what it looks like. You can see that the oats have helped to absorb much of that one cup of beef broth that we put in there. And so we have kind of a, a loose meatloaf. <laughs> is that what you would say? Sounds like a pudding to me. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And so we will go ahead and sit down and have something to eat. Here's haggis all served up, ready to eat with our homemade sourdough bread and our brie cheese. And we are going to now enjoy this nice lunch for me for the first time. It's a big deal. The inaugural <laughs> bite of haggis here. Drum roll. Yeah. <laughs> all right, let's see all what right. this tastes like. All right.
think we did okay. Yeah, it is good. It's really mild. Um, what comes through for me, um, I think it's the coriander, mm -hmm. for sure, and a little bit of the nutmeg. Yeah, the nutmeg and cinnamon are often flavors you actually pick up on. Yeah, yeah. No, this is great. Um, I, I would definitely do this again, and also um, maybe experiment with other types of meats as yeah, well. Yeah, absolutely. To see. I wonder yeah. even like chicken. Could you do it with ground chicken or turkey? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, at that point, I think you're 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 on the final frontier of is it a haggis anymore? But this is yeah. already you know heading in that direction a little bit. Yeah, so. I just wonder if the haggis per se is. Um, you know, predicated on the particular type of meat or if it's more just the method of cooking. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, and we do have the bread and the brie, and as Chris said, this is a, an adaptation from something that he experienced yeah. in Scotland. Um, but I'm going to fantasize, uh, and you all can Google it, uh, about the brie becoming uh, into <laughs> this uh, mixture here historically because the Scots and the French also have a history together. And so... Um, you can read about yeah, they that. They call that the own. old alliance between Scotland yeah. and Yeah, old and as in A U L D. A U L D. Yes, yes. exactly. Yeah. All right, well, so thank you very much. This has been my pleasure. Great. Yes, good fun. Uh, had a good time. So we're now going to eat, and I highly recommend you try this recipe. And if you like it, let me know. Feel free to like and share and subscribe. And until next time, we will see you later. Siapst.